Hi, everyone. Hi. So that song was such a good intro to Kyle's talk because I could watch him getting like antsy and hear wrong, wrong, <laughs> which it, it all is. And he will teach you all about that during his talk today. Um, I agree with I love Christmas. I don't care much for the baby Jesus, but I love Christmas. So he's going to make the case today that we should all celebrate Christmas. We should all have a really good time with it. And even if you're not a person of faith, that's still okay. And you still get to do that. Um, Kyle is an associate uh, professor of philosophy at King's College, which is in Wilkes-Barre. I know we have some people from the area here today. Um, and he's been featured in a lot of books, including writing essays for, was it The Matrix? I'm in, no, yes. I'm actually not in The Matrix and Philosophy. I'm not in that one. Oh. Uh, Inception, though. Inception, is, yes. that's what it is. He has a wonderful other talk about Inception that I hope he'll come back and do again one day. But Kyle's a very accomplished writer. He's a very accomplished professor. He writes for uh, Psychology Today. He writes uh, for uh, Wiley Blackwell's Philosophy and Pop Culture series. And you can see him all over YouTube. If you go to a conference that has to do with humanist stuff, philosophy stuff, you may run into him there. Um, and as usual, we're looking forward to a really, really fun talk with Kyle today about Christmas. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Kate. I got it. Okay. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. A little plug there. Yeah, so I also uh, am a professor for uh, the great courses. I have two courses with them one on the big questions of philosophy, uh, and then another one uh, on metaphysics, both, are, both of which are very, very fun. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to stand behind this podium. Uh, I, well, I guess I'm going to be standing right in front of the thing, though, if I don't. All right, so we're going to adjust slightly here. Here we go. All right. Um, slight correction, Kate. Uh, I am not going to argue that everyone should celebrate Christmas. Let me adjust a little bit here so I'm not breathing into it. Is that all right? Good there? OK. I'm not going to argue that everyone should celebrate Christmas. Uh, I'm basically going to argue that if you want to celebrate Christmas, regardless of whether you're Christian or not, if you're a humanist, that is perfectly fine. Uh, and that it is perfectly fine to celebrate in whatever way you wish, uh, and that whatever way that you choose is not going to be any more or less authentic uh, than ways other people choose to celebrate, uh, including Christians. So the Christian way of celebrating Christmas is not any more appropriate or any more authentic um, than ways humanists might celebrate Christmas. Uh, but I will argue that it is perfectly fine to call it Christmas and to say, I celebrate Christmas even though you are not uh, a Christian. That's be one of the arguments that I make. Um, although I do like the moniker Chris Smith. I think that's kind of clever. Um, all right, so uh, a note before we get started here. Um, the, uh, the PowerPoint here is extremely text heavy on some of them. Uh, the text is for me, not for you. Do not try to read these. It is it's not worth your time. Um, the text is there to remind me what to say in what order and that kind of stuff. Uh, if you want this, probably like if you do want to go and, and look at something a little bit more closely, this is already up on my academia.edu site. So if you just Google my name, David Cal Johnson, academia.edu, you'll see basically everything I've ever done. Uh, and I have a little section on public speaking and the PowerPoint for my public speak. My public talks are there, and the PowerPoint for this is there, so you can I'll get that there. Uh, it's. It's pretty long, so I'm not going to be doing everything. Like, I may skip past a few slides, um, but it's all in here. So if there's something that you want more information on, in fact, I'll probably just throw uh, to the book a couple of times during the presentation. It's all in here, and I have some for sale. Kate's got one back there. Uh, I'll sign it and give you a copy for 20 bucks uh, afterwards, if you so choose. Um, so there you go. All right? So here we go. I actually gave this talk uh, to this group depending on how you, your ontology of groups, if it's the same group, uh, about five years ago. Um, and so some of you may have seen this, but Kate said there's been enough overturn in the group that this will be very new to a lot of you, so she thought it would be a good uh, uh, example. And I gave this talk last time, the year after Tom Flynn had come and spoke uh, on this subject. And Tom Flynn uh, has a book called The Trouble with Christmas, I believe. Uh, and he basically argues that if you're not a Christian, you shouldn't celebrate Christmas, especially if you're an atheist or a humanist. Uh, you should not celebrate Christmas. You're adding legitimacy uh, to their holiday. Um, you're uh, one of the things, you, you know, uh, how, how, can you, how can you not like Christianity or think it's a bad thing if you celebrate Christmas, the biggest Christian holiday, right? Um, 
He doesn't celebrate. He even goes into work on Christmas Day. Uh, says he gets a lot done because no one else is there. Um, I'm going to disagree with him on a very, very fundamental level uh, and argue, as I said, uh, that it is perfectly fine to choose to celebrate Christmas if you so choose to and that you can celebrate how you want. I am going to make some recommendations at the end uh, about maybe some better or worse ways to celebrate, like kind of empirically better or worse, uh, kind of sort of a kind of utilitarian argument in a certain kind of way. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that towards the end. Um, so, okay, so um, basically, the, I mean, the book is called The Myth of the Soul Christmas. Uh, each chapter is a particular myth that I take on. Uh, and so the myth that I take on in chapter one is the myth that we just saw in that wonderful song. Uh, from the ACLU, whatever that's done for, uh, not, right? Uh, so basically the idea is that Christmas originated with the birth of Christ so that if Christ wasn't born, we wouldn't celebrate uh, during this time of year at all. Um, and that like our, you know, our traditions uh, originate from that, right? So the reason that we give gifts to children at Christmas time is because the wise men gave, gave gifts to the little baby Jesus, right? And so we're just continuing that kind of tradition, uh, like that's the origin of that, right? And so that, um, of course, they, they admit that it's been commercialized a little bit lately, uh, right? But uh, essentially everything, including Santa Claus, finds its origin in Christianity and Christian lore. Uh, and so if it weren't for the birth of baby Jesus and Christianity itself, Christmas would not be a thing. Christmas would not be a holiday, right? Um, that's, I mean, we, I think we can all agree that that's the view that was endorsed by the song that we just heard, right? Um, so, this is a myth. This is false. Uh, this is why I was shouting wrong uh, through the entire thing, right? Because it is definitely wrong. So, to establish this, that this is a myth that it's okay to celebrate Christmas if, even if you're an atheist or a humanist, uh, I'm basically going to do two things. I'm going to present an early history of Christmas. Then I'm going to show how and why Christmas re-emerged as a major holiday during the 1800s. Uh, and then show how and why Christmas, uh, oh, excuse me, and then three, I'm going to reveal why this history entails that Christmas is not a Christian holiday uh, and that Christians have no rightful claim on it or to dictate how it should be celebrated and thus celebrating it in, in no way endorses Christianity. And then again, at the end, I'm going to follow up with some suggestions uh, for how maybe celebrating uh, certain ways might be harmful and celebrating other ways might be more useful. All right, so let's start with the early history here. <coughs> oh, goodness, sorry about that. Um, okay, so before Jesus would have even been born, there, are, there were celebrations that were happening in mid to late December, uh, many of them with different motivations, right? So we had the Mesopotamians, uh, 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 celebrating Zagmuk, uh, the basic idea in this celebration, again, this is 4,000 BCE, 4,000 years before Christ would have been born, um, where they had a, a god named Marduk who they thought had to fight off forces of evil and chaos in the underworld uh, in order to bring back spring every year. Uh, and you have to remember, of course, if we're talking about ancient peoples here, they had no way of knowing what, why the days kept getting shorter every year and what made them come back longer every year. Basically, as the days got shorter, uh, they weren't assured that they would just keep getting shorter and then the sun would just no longer be there anymore, right? Uh, and so they had these rituals for trying to bring them back. In the Mesopotamians' case, uh, they thought the god Marduk fought off the, cars, the, the forces of chaos in order to bring it back, but that he needed help. And so what they would do is actually kill their king in order for him to descend into the underworld uh, in order to help Marduk uh, fight off the forces of chaos. Of course, kings did not like very much being killed, uh, and so what they would do is they would often take a servant, uh, or more likely a prisoner uh, or a peasant, and say, hey, how would you like to be king for a day? And of course, for most of them, this would actually, especially if they were a prisoner, this would actually be a good deal, right? Like, do I just live out the rest of my life in prison and then die, or I could actually have my every whim desired, for, you know, granted for a day, and then I would be killed. This is actually a better fate for them. And so they would agree, and they would have every whim granted for a day, and then they would be killed at the end of the day, sacrificed at the end of the day, to go and uh, help Marduk fight off the forces of chaos. And then, of course, when they started getting longer, uh, they would celebrate uh, his victory, right? Uh, a very similar uh, um, tradition in Persian Babylonia called Sayaka, 
uh, where essentially there was feasting uh, and a mock king with an execution uh, and some social inversion where the rich would look after the poor and that kind of stuff. And it had to do with this, like the social inversion has to do with this. You make somebody, like you make a peasant or a, a, a servant or a prisoner king for a day. It's the rich people kind of looking after the poor in a certain kind of way. And that starts this social inversion process uh, where uh, the poor are given a favored status for a day. Um, it, by 5000 BC in the Roman Republic, we get Saturnalia. These old traditions kind of morph into something called Saturnalia, uh, where there's social inversion. There's a mock king, but they don't execute the mock king uh, in this particular case. Um, there's feasting. There's drinking. Uh, there's some small gifts that are exchanged. Uh, and there's lots and lots of sex uh, during this time. Um, and the reason for this, the reason that, I mean, this makes a lot of sense uh, in a Roman uh, kind of agricultural society is that... Uh, in an agricultural society, December, November, December, uh, and around the New Year, around the, when the days started getting longer, I shouldn't say New Year, when the days start getting longer, is the perfect time to celebrate. Because not only are you celebrating the fact that the days are getting longer, but this is the one time of year that you actually have plentiful food because the harvest is in and you have no work to do because you don't plan until the spring. Right? So there's literally nothing to do. And then you have all this abundance of food. You also have uh, you know, wine. Uh, it's very abundance of wine. And it was usually the only time they had fresh meat. Uh, because they would usually call the herds before winter to make it easy for them to survive. And so it was the only time they had, like, what else are you going to do, right? Uh, and, of course, winter was a time that was very hard to survive uh, in, and so they're basically kind of fattening up for winter uh, in a certain kind of way. And so it was the ex perfect excuse uh, to party. And, of course, since it's fueled by alcohol, there's lots of sex involved uh, as well, right? Uh, and there is also this, this social inversion that goes on at this time. Saturn had proclaimed that let every man be treated equal, slave and freed man, poor or rich. No one may be ill-tempered. Ill All shall drink the same wine have their meat on equal terms. When a rich man gives a banquet to his servants, his friends shall aid him in waiting on them. There's this social inversion in, uh, in Saturnalia uh, as well. All right? uh, and then around the same time, the Scandinavians are celebrating Yule, uh, where there's lots of feasting. Uh, they have traditions of bringing evergreens uh, into the house, decorating the house with evergreens, uh, mainly because the evergreens were seen as kind of magic, uh, because if you look around in winter, all the other plants are dying. And yet the evergreens stay green. These things seem to have some kind of magic life potency. And so the kind of idea was you bring them into your house to let some of that rub off on you, right? Because winter was a time when a lot of people died over the winter, right? Uh, and in fact, this is why mistletoe and that kind of stuff uh, has, a special, uh, has special powers because not only does it stay green, it actually bears fruit during the winter. It must be especially fertile. So if you get near it, you can get under its spell. Right? And this is why you have to kiss or make love uh, to anyone uh, nearby if you're near the mistletoe. That was the idea. Uh, they also have God, Odin and Thor, uh, that are traveling uh, the countryside during this time as well, doing December visiting and that kind of stuff. Um, I talked a bit more about that last time when I talked about Santa Claus. Again, if you want to know more about Santa, he's in the book. Uh, here's a nice picture of Saturnalia. You can see the partying. Uh, lots of nakedness and feasting and drinking. Um, here's another one. And so this is the context of what December was like when Christianity first came on the scene, right? Um, and it was already a popular December celebration in the Roman Empire, so from the Republic to the Empire. Jesus would have been born between 15 BCE and 15 CE, if the nativities are anything like, uh, that are accurate, although that's questionable. We'll talk about that uh, in a minute. But the earliest writings of Paul and Mark mention nothing about Jesus' birth. And so it's difficult to see where, like, I mean, so, for example, like the claim that we, dis we dis celebrate in December because Jesus was born in December has no historical basis at all. The, um, again, we don't really know anything about when Jesus would have been born or where he would have been born uh, from the early Christian writings, Paul and Mark. Um, Mark, Luke, Luke and Matthew wanted to establish Jesus' uh, status as special uh, from birth, uh, but the birth stories are actually very different and contradictory. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, other additions to the birth story were made by pseudo-gospels, like a virgin birth and perpetual virginity and that kind of stuff. But the early Christians for the first 350 years of Christian history did not celebrate even their own birthdays, much less Jesus' birthday. This would have been a completely foreign concept to them entirely to celebrate Jesus' birthday. Um, despite that, they wanted some stories about Jesus' birth, 
And so two Gospels, Matthew and Luke, do tell the story uh, and try to establish that he's special from birth. But there's something, and this is kind of an aside, but I think it's really important, uh, something especially noteworthy to note about Luke and Matthew. Uh, they are not the same story. In fact, they don't go together at all. In fact, they can't go together at all. What you see in a nativity scene with the shepherds and the ox and the donkey and the, um, and the wise men and the, the manger and all that kind of stuff are really stuff from three or four different versions of stories and other interpretations of other stuff just kind of slammed together into one thing where there actually is like there's no, that's not historically accurate. Uh, not even historic. That's not even the right. Like you're literally taking contradictory stories, ignoring the parts that that contradict each other, and just cramming it together into kind of one picturesque scene. Um, but it's not accurate. It's not even biblically biblically accurate at all. All right. There's major differences between the stories, and there's inconsistencies. So, for example, in Matthew, this is where we hear about Herod, uh, the wise men visiting, the slaughter of the innocents, uh, the star that appears above the manger, the angel appears to Joseph, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. Actually, the star does not appear before the, uh, the manger in Matthew, because the manger is not in Matthew. Jesus is just born in his house. Um, that's in Bethlehem. The angel appears to Joseph there. All of those things are not in Luke. None of them are. In Luke, the angel appears to Mary, not Joseph. Uh, there's a census. There's shepherds. There's a host of angels. There's the inn in the manger, the temple presentation. All of that is in Luke, completely absent from Matthew. All right? And you might think, well, well, maybe they're just like they're telling two halves of the same story and you can push that stuff together, uh, but you can't because there are considerable contradictions between the two stories. Uh, two of the main ones are location and then time period. Uh, Matthew's story starts in Bethlehem. The Holy Family lives there. The family flees to Egypt because Herod's threat, and then after Herod dies, they move to Nazareth, someplace they had never, ever been before. All right? In Luke's story, they start in Nazareth. That's where the Holy Family lives. They go to Bethlehem because of the census. They can make a little stop uh, in Jerusalem after the baby's born in Bethlehem, and then they return to Nazareth. So literally, if you were to map out the two stories, let's see if I can uh, let me go back there. All right. So Matthew starts here. I'm sorry. Matthew starts here. Holy Family lives here. Goes down here to flee to Egypt. Come back. And the other one. Luke starts in Nazareth, go to Bethlehem, come back. They're, they don't overlap at all, right? What's going on here is that they did know a couple of things about Jesus. Mark had mentioned that basically it was tradition that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He had to because he was a, you know, the son of David or whatever. He's supposed to be born there. Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. But everybody knew Jesus was from Nazareth, right? Like this is the first argument against Jesus' Messiahship. How could he be the Messiah? He, he was, he's from Nazareth. Messiah has to be from, from Bethlehem, right? And so... Basically, these two authors give an ad hoc explanation for why or how he could have been born in Bethlehem, but from Nazareth. They just give two completely different contradictory stories, right? For Matthew, he was born in Bethlehem because that's where his family lived when he was born. But he grew up in Nazareth because they had to flee Bethlehem because of Herod and then move to Nazareth later, right? For Luke, he's from Nazareth, because that's where the Holy Family lives. He just happened to have been born in Bethlehem because at the time of his birth, they were pulled down to Bethlehem for a census. Right? Is that making sense? They're, they're giving two completely different ad hoc explanations for why it could be true that he's born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. All right. So the other problem is time period. These two stories do not happen at the same time. Matthew uh, has Herod ruling. This is when, when Jesus is born. Herod is ruling. Herod died in 4 BCE. Uh, so if you do the math, and it actually takes it to... The wise men a couple years to get there. So like the wise men were not there on the year, on the, the anniversary or on the night of his birth. They're actually there like two years later. Uh, Luke specifically places the, pre the, the precursors of the story, the heralding of the birth, during the days of Herod's reign, but then specifically places all the other events after those days. Even more specifically, Luke says the birth takes place while Quirinius is governor of Syria, and he began his rule of governor in Syria in 6 CE. So we have 4 BCE, 6 CE, there's a considerable time difference between the two stories. So Matthew and Luke are saying different things about when the birth actually occurred. Um, both knew nothing of Jesus' birth. They were simply telling a story consistent with what they knew, or uh, what they thought they knew anyway. All right. Uh, there's some other problems with the historicity of these stories. Uh, no census ever required someone to relocate to somewhere else to take the census. That is just complete, that's just non-historical. There's no record of any census ever requiring that. 
as much less one based on ancestral relations ba dating back a thousand years, right? Like, where would you go if you had to return to your where your thousand-year-old forefather was born to take a seat? You have no idea. Like, they knew, right? It, it's just ridiculous. No census ever required that. Um, there's no record of a census under Caesar Augustus. And that's when it, that's who supposedly issued it, but he never did such a thing. Uh, there's no record of a slaughter of innocents in uh, by Herod in Bethlehem, and there were careful records that were took. No record of that. A star that leads and stops over a specific location makes absolutely no sense. You think about, like, look at a star in the sky and go, oh, yeah, that's over that house. That makes no sense at all, right? You can't even do that with the moon, much less a star. Um, Magi would not have arrived until two years later. Uh, Matthew's virginal conception, thinking that, that, uh, uh, that, uh, Jesus was, uh, that Mary was a virgin when she conceived of Jesus, is actually based on a mistranslation of Isaiah 7.14. He actually mentions that verse as the prophecy to say that uh, a virgin would conceive, and he's looking at a Greek translation of the Old Testament, and that Greek translation mistranslated the Hebrew word for young woman into the Greek word for virgin. There's a different word in Hebrew for virgin. It's not in that passage. Well, he just misunderstood. He was reading a bad translation. Um, there is no way shepherds would watch their flocks by night at the end of December uh, when the days were shortest. Uh, and so, like I saw a billboard on the way here that said, Jesus is the reason for the season, and like references Luke, uh, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, if I'm, if I'm getting my... Uh, which one Luke's... Uh, let me make sure I've got the... Yeah, Luke's got the shepherds in it, watching their flocks by night. Luke is actually proof that Jesus is not the reason for the season because the shepherds were watching their flocks by night and there's no way in hell they would be doing that in December. Right, so clearly he's not the reason for the season, right? Um, so, in other words, right, this is a billboard that was up a few years ago. Uh, you know it's a myth, right? We, we actually know, like biblically we know this is a myth, right? Uh, the Bible story can even be true. So how does, if, if the Christians are not celebrating Jesus' birth, not even anyone's birthday, for the first 350 years of, of, Christmas's exist, or of, 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 of Christianity's existence. They're not celebrating Christmas. How do they start doing this? How does Jesus' birth become a thing that, that Christians celebrate? Well, basically what happens is Constantine converts to Christianity uh, in the early 300s. All right? Now, at that time, what Romans were doing was celebrating Saturnalia uh, and specifically the sun god Sol, uh, they were celebrating his birthday because he was believed to be born on December 25th, right? Why? Basically because this was their solstice. Uh, this isn't exactly when the solstice occurs, uh, but as far as I can tell, they did, they did December 25th. They, they had his, his birthday, the sun god's birthday on December 25th because this is when the days start getting noticeably longer. And so this is when the sun's making its comeback. So this is, this is when the sun's making its comeback. This is much, must have been when he was originally born. Um, and uh, so that's why they had his, his son's birthday on December 25th. Are you still okay on the mic? Good? Okay. All right. Um, here's the problem, though, right? So Constantine converts to Christianity, but all of his soldiers and all of his government aren't Christian. And they all celebrate the solstice, and they celebrate soul god's birthday on December 25th, right? How can the Roman Empire be officially Christian with a Christian emperor and yet, the, all the government and all the military are celebrating non-Christian gods, right? Well, basically, the solution is, we're just going to declare that Jesus was, Jesus was born on December 25th, too. So that all the celebrating that's going on, it's really in the name of Jesus, right? Uh, and so, and this basically kind of aids in the conversion of, of the empire. Um, he did not, he could not convert his empire by, or army by force, uh, but he also couldn't have been celebrating Anyway, so basically he just declares that all the celebrating is done in the name of Christ, right? Uh, it doesn't, like, take hold initially, and the people don't really care, right? Hey, as long as we get the party, call it what you want, Constantine. We'll, we'll still do our, we'll still do exactly what we've always done, and that's exactly what happened, right? Um, but so starts, in fact, the, around 336, December 25th, was first identified in print as the anniversary of Jesus' birth, that's as old as the actual official recognition uh, sees, uh, that we can see. So, but this is what starts the Christian effort to Christianize December celebrations, right? Um, I would call it the war, the war for Christmas, not on Christmas, but there's this war that starts to be waged for Christmas, although it's not called Christmas at this point, um, to try to Christianize these December celebrations and claim them as their own. So everybody who's celebrating December, they can say, see, they're one of us. They're, they're celebrating one of our holidays. 
um, people do begin to forget the real origin of the celebration. Uh, and so, so, they, they, so it's somewhat successful. We'll talk about some of the successes and non-successes uh, here in a minute. Now, there's some argument about this, like why would Constantine want to do this? Uh, he was motivated by conversion. Why was Constantine motivated by conversion to change over the holiday? Well, for one, the December, December, the December 25th day can't be a coincidence, right? Like, it's not like he just, oh, there's other reasons for thinking that Jesus was also born on December 25th. Like, it's clearly borrowed from the soul. There actually is one person who argued that that was false, but I, I repeat that in the book if you're on that. Um, he had to either eliminate everyone's favorite holiday or Christianize it, and he wasn't going to eliminate it. So he had to Christianize it. And in fact, there's evidence that before Christians, uh, that, the, that even Christians before Constantine were, uh oh, okay. Do, do I just need to move it up? Is that, yeah, just, I can, okay. I would, oh, no, it's. I, I think it might have shut off or something. It's dead, yeah, it sure did die. So I didn't mute it. Sorry. Check one. Check one. Okay. But it needs to, they need it for that. So here we go. All right. No problemo. Let me uh, take this out. So uh, there is evidence that even before Constantine, Christians were trying to Christian or were trying to basically subvert sun worship and adapt it for their own methods, for their own means. So uh, what do I mean by that? There we go. All right. So um, Aurelius, uh, Aurelian had declared sun worship the official Roman Im uh, religion around 270 to unify the empire and combat Christianity. Evidence suggests that there was a kind of propaganda war that ensued between, um, uh, between Christianity and sun worship, uh, where Pope Leo was complaining that Christians were still bowing to the sun before they entered St. Peter's Basilica as late as the mid-400s. So there was this kind of constant trying to appropriate uh, sun worship into Christianity. This is why, I mean, Christianity was a sect of Judaism, right? The, the Jewish Sabbath is from Friday night to Saturday night. Right? But the Christian Sabbath is on Sunday. Why? It's right in the name. Sunday. That was when Sol was worshipped. And so the Christians actually moved their holy day to Sunday to try to accommodate <laughs> sun worship and sun worshipers. Right? Uh, in fact, artwork depicting Jesus riding the sun chariot across the skies from the late 300 actually exists. Uh, so this is actually Sol Invictus here. Riding the chariot, this is actually Jesus riding the sun chariot across the sky. Uh, and in fact, this is where Jesus' halo, this is Sol Invictus, this is a modern depiction of Jesus, the little sunbeams coming out in the halo. This is actually where the halo comes from, is from Sol Invictus, because he's supposed to be the sun god. He is the thing that travels across the sky, right? That's why it looks the way it does. Uh, and so you can find, like, this is, like, you can see Sol Invictus here. And this, of course, is Jesus with the, and then, I don't know which one this is. It could be either one. Right, because they're so similar. Right? So I'm not, I'm not saying that Jesus was, the idea of Jesus was borrowed from soul. I'm saying that elements of the soul persona were incorporated into Jesus later on uh, in Christian history. Right? <coughs> so it's important to realize that these efforts were part of a campaign to claim late December celebrations for Christ to make people think that the holiday originated from Christianity and ultimately to Christianize the holiday. Most of these efforts, some of these efforts were successful. So like for example, most people did forget the origins of the holiday and they think that Jesus is the reason for the season. They think the reason we celebrate in December historically is because of Christ's birth. And this is celebrated today, given the song that we saw, right? Um, but others were not. The holiday was never Christianized. Uh, the reason that Constantine had to relabel the holiday instead of eliminate it uh, is because he couldn't. People weren't going to stop celebrating their favorite holiday, and they weren't going to change the way they did. I mean, can you imagine if you know, the president declared that you can't celebrate Christmas anymore, right? It's not going to happen, right? No one's going to stop celebrating. Constantine couldn't do the same thing. Um, so he tr it, it was never Christianized. It was, it, the name of Christ was kind of was added to it. And we'll talk about where the name comes from here in a minute. Um, but it was never Christianized in that the celebrations didn't change to Christian-focused holy celebrations that only concentrated on Jesus' birth. The raucous customs of misrule, of social inversion, of heavy drinking, and wild sex continued. We basically continued celebrating in the exact same way that we had always celebrated. It just sort of had Christ's label on it. Like Jesus was just kind of tacked on to those existing celebrations. But the celebrations themselves did not really change that much, right? Now, 
And the church tried to tone things down. They, they did exciting things, like they added a midnight mass uh, to the schedule of masses that you would have to go to, uh, and then also a morning mass, uh, and a sunrise mass, and then an evening mass, right? Um, we're trying to keep people away from parties. Advent, Epiphany, they added a whole bunch of events in the calendar surrounding the December 25th date, right? Um, interestingly, even throughout the Middle Ages, some good Christians bookended their midnight mass uh, with orgies. You go to an orgy, you go to mass, then you go to an orgy afterwards. Um, I believe it's Schieffer that talks about some of this tradition actually continued uh, as late as the 1820s in Ireland. There were evidence of, of these kinds of activities uh, in Ireland. Um, complaints were made to the Pope about heathen celebrations of Christmas, uh, of Christians at Christmas, particularly in Rome uh, throughout the Middle Ages, that people still celebrated in these raucous, se uh, secular ways, even though it's supposed to be about Christ. Um, and it didn't help that as Christianity rolled through Europe, it assimilated other winter celebrations that it found. Uh, so, for example, uh, Yule, the Norse Yule, uh, was a uh, December celebration that they had because they had similar reasons for celebrating because the winter was returning or the winter was ending and spring was returning and that kind of stuff, right? And so they celebrated that and so they incorporated the mistletoe and they incorporated the evergreens and the lights and that kind of stuff into their celebrations. Um, midnight Mass was called Christ's Mass because tradition held that Jesus was born at midnight uh, on December 24th, 5th. Um, on you know, year one or whatever, that's what tradition had, had become to behold. Uh, and eventually that name stuck, Christmas, right? Uh, but it didn't stick until around the 1100s. Um, interestingly, that's around the same time that some French nuns start giving gifts uh, in, a, in St. Nicholas's name uh, to children. Again, that's a whole other story. Verse five and six. Um, but this effort to try to Christianize the holiday, to tone it down specifically, to make it more religious and pious and less raucous and secular, never succeeded. In fact, in the book I talk about these giant feasts that, that kings would put on and stuff like that. They had nothing to do with Christianity. Uh, and they were raucous and alcohol fueled and that kind of stuff. In fact, the effort to Christianize the holiday, to tone it down, was so unsuccessful that by the time the Puritans come along, they try to ban Christmas. They see it as a horrible, awful, secular celebration filled with alcohol and sex, because it was. And so they literally, were, where, the, where the Puritans have power, they try to suppress it. They literally make it illegal to celebrate Christmas. Uh, if you take the day off on Christmas Day, you can be fined or even put in jail uh, in, a, in, a, in, a Puritan, uh, in Puritan America, uh, as it were. Um, uh, you couldn't even go to church. If you went to church on Christmas Day, unless it was a Sunday, you could get in trouble, right? So, you, you can find some sermons from incre uh, Increased Matter and Cotton Matter that preach against the evils of Christmas. Basically, you have lines like, there is more evil and debauchery uh, done during, during, by men in the 12 days of Christmas than in all the other days of the year. That kind of, those, kind of, those kind of sermons, right? Um, so they didn't control everything. The Puritans didn't. But celebrating Christmas remained very unpopular through the 1600s and into the 1800s both in Europe and in the American colonies because of this influence of the Puritans and their kind of war against Christmas. Um, it wasn't even a nationally recognized holiday in America until 1870, 100 years after our founding, that Christmas is actually recognized as a national holiday. So here's some Don's Puritans looking disapprovingly uh, on some raucous Christmas celebrations. Yeah, they did. It's a little more conservative here, but uh, you can actually see a little bit of sexual rock in this. Here's some mistletoe, and this guy's trying to come onto this girl here, so there's still some sexualness there. All right. um, so, um, my guess, I'm not exactly sure what you do, my guess is this kid's up to no good. <laughs> well, um, so, now, as Puritan influence decreased, interest in Christmas increased. It started to make a comeback. Um, but when it did, the revived traditions were not Christian traditions. All right? um, feasting, drinking, and sex were basically the order of the day. Uh, and by the way, it was usually something that people only celebrated for a day, maybe two, but usually just a day. It wasn't something that went on. There wasn't a Christmas season that went on for weeks on end uh, that started at, you know, after Halloween and doesn't end uh, until you know, mid-January. Right? Uh, it was something that you only did for a short amount of time. 
Feasting, drinking, was sailing, uh, feasting, drinking, and sex were uh, order of the day. Was sailing and mumming and begging were also uh, uh, involved. And this is a very interesting part of Christmas history. Uh, where, again, when these traditions uh, uh, resurfaced, you had this tradition of wassailing. Wassailing uh, is basically kind of like a Christmas trick-or-treat, but on steroids. So if you were a rich landowner, and usually this would be farmers and that kind of stuff, right? And you had servants that worked for you, you were socially obligated to open up the doors of your house and invite your servants to come in on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. And what the, the social exchange was is that you were they were obligated to basically sing songs uh, demanding the house's food, the best food and drink of the house, and you were obligated to, give the, obligated to give it to them. And then when you did, they would sing you songs of well-wishing in return. In his book, The Battle for Christmas, Stephen, ba Stephen Nissenbaum calls this a social safety valve, uh, that basically the poor were able to kind of let out their frustrations uh, and, and uh, kind of take charge for a day, uh, and then like, the master of the house is also able to kind of solidify his position as the superior because he's the one that's providing the food and drink, but also he shows he's not such a bad guy because he's providing the food and drink. And so it serves as this kind of nice uh, social safety valve uh, that exists uh, at that time. Um, this actually helps make sense, I think, of one of the most confusing Christmas songs out there. We wish you a Merry Christmas. Now bring us some figgy pudding. We won't leave until we get some, right? Why are these people, why do they care about figgy pudding and why won't they leave? and write a uh, cup of good cheer, right? Bring us all of this, and then once it's finally brought, ah, we miss you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. It's an old sailing song. That's what we wish you a Merry Christmas uh, is. Um, and so we would, you know, there was mumming and begging involved, which is a similar kind of tradition where people would kind of beg for food. Carolyn kind of comes from this as well. Uh, they're, they're very related. Um, interestingly, uh, in the antebellum South, Christmas was a time uh, when there would be kind of special gifts given to slaves. Um, they would be able to host parties uh, at the slave quarters. Sometimes they would be allowed entry, depending on the plantation owner, into the house, uh, to, into the big house, and they could fix a Christmas dinner there. Sometimes they were even granted freedom during that time to go to different plantations and visit family uh, as long as they returned. Um, but there was also some, uh, and this also serves as a kind of safety, uh, social safety valve where people are kind of solidifying their place in social hierarchy uh, with this. Um, interesting, I talk about this in the book as well. Sometimes it was used maliciously, so they would hold back necessities from the slaves and then give them to them as Christmas gifts when it's like, like little like food and drink and that kind of stuff, like they needed to survive and they would, they would give them only at that time. Uh, and then also one of the little tricks that they would do, and uh, Frederick Douglass talks about this, is this would be one time that, that slaves would get alcohol, but they would not warn them about it. They would just give this some abundance of alcohol and the slaves would drink themselves sick. And then they would have basically equate, Frederick, Frederick Douglass actually puts it in these terms, the slave would come to think that that's what freedom was like. Freedom was like alcohol poisoning basically, and it makes you so ill, I'd rather just be a slave. And so they kind of gladly returned to the fields because they had been fooled by their, their owners into thinking that that's what freedom was actually like, right? Um, and so there's some, the social safety valves, but there's also some nefar nefarious things that go on uh, at that time as well. So here's some pictures of a sailing. Getting the, so the servants and the master there, getting the best food and drink. There's some antebellum uh, slave celebrations. Uh, you can see some of the white gentry here in the background there uh, at this celebration. Uh, this would have been at the slave headquarters it looks like, or slave quarters it looks like. Um, when it makes its comeback, one of the things that helps it uh, make its comeback in a big, huge way is Charles Dickens' uh, Christmas Carol. Uh, you cannot, under, you cannot uh, overstate how much influence it had. Um, it was read, if, how do I put this? Like, to get on the New York Times bestseller list today, if you get like 0.1% of the literate population to, read, to buy your book, you're gonna be like number one on the New York Times bestseller list, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's, it, that's hard to do, by the way, to get 0.1%, right? But it's a very small portion. Like, I, I got the exact numbers in the book, but it's around 50% of the literate population bought an authentic actual copy of Dickens' Tale. I mean, it was just, it was monumentally successful. Um, and what's really important to realize is that when the story came out, celebrating Christmas was not a popular thing. It was not something that a lot of people did. It was this kind of side thing that some people did. Um, today, when we see Scrooge and he won't give, uh, uh, he won't give Cratchit uh, the day off for Christmas, we think, ah, oh, what a jerk, right? Like, what an unusual, he's like, he's, he's the curmudgeon, he's the one that's not doing it. Cratchit's actually the odd man out for asking the day off. Scrooge was just doing what everybody else did. Nobody closed on Christmas Day, that would be a basically equivalent to closing your business on St. Patrick's Day at the time. It was just not a popular holiday. 
Cratchit was the weird one. Cratchit's basically, hey, it's St. Patrick's Day today. Can I, can I have a paid day off tomorrow? No, you have to work. It's just St. Patrick's Day, right? I mean, that's basically what Scrooge is doing, right? Um, for example, the butcher at which Scrooge gets the turkey for Cratchit at the end of the story, they're open on Christmas Day. Because everybody knew they'd be open on New Year's, because everybody's open on Christmas Day, right? Scratch is actually the odd man out. Some other kind of interesting things to realize about the Christmas Carol, I go on on this for way too long. Scrooge is not Scrooge McDuck with this giant pile of money in a safe that he dives in and swims in his gold. And Cratchit is not this horrible, awful peasant that has to cut a bean for dinner. And like, Scrooge is a businessman who owns a business that has one employee. It's a county house with one employee. He is not this rich curmudgeon. He's a decently successful, he owns a business. Right? And then Cratchit is not a lowly peasant with cutting. Like, he has a non factory job. He's not working in a coal mine. Right? He actually knows it. He actually has an office right next to his boss. Right? His wife does not have to work. He's not that bad off. He's a little bit less than Scrooge. Right? But he's not this poor peasant. Right? Um, Scrooge does eventually learn to give to the poor in the story at the end. Um, but and notice that. When Scrooge, what, like the lesson that Scrooge learns uh, is not to like give gifts to kids, right? And to buy a bunch of presents. That's not, just, that's not what Scrooge learns, that you should give to the poor and spend time with your family. That's the lesson of A Christmas Carol. That's what Christmas is about. Giving to the poor, spending time with your family. Not about gifts, not about presents, anything like that. Because presents weren't really a part of Christmas at that time, right? But because A Christmas Carol is so successful, it makes people want to celebrate Christmas again. There's these interesting stories um, in a book by, and I forget the name of it offhand, it's called The Man Who Invented Christmas. It's about Dickens. Uh, it's an inaccurate title, but um, talks about how business owners, like public readings of, of Dickens' tale was like, oh, I'm now inspired. I'm gonna give all my employees the day off at Christmas now. Right, and this is actually kind of where this started, giving people the day off is, is, is from Dickens. Um, the, popular, the, pop, the, the popularity of the story helped popularize the holiday, but again, when people started celebrating again, it wasn't in religious ways. It was in secular ways that they celebrated, right? As industrialization, and this is, so this is the other thing, another big influence here. And as industrialization increased, capitalism widened the gap between the rich and the poor, not only monetarily, like literally they had more money, uh, but also like the actual geographical gap so that if you were poor, you didn't work directly for a master that you knew that could invite you into their house at Christmas and you could let off some steam. You were just relegated to the slums, right? And so with sailing and the social inversion that's involved with it, it eventually becomes kind of a form of protest where poor people band together and go through the streets and try to get into rich people's houses that they don't know, right? <laughs> um, and obviously the rich don't like this very much, right? And so, uh, Clement Clark Moore and a few of these rich New Yorkers uh, who had this kind of Dutch identity for New York that didn't really exist, um, set out to actually try to change the holiday and stop it from being about poor people trying to get into your house into being about children, basically, right? Uh, and so Clint Moore pins this story about this rich landowner who's worried about with sailors, right? He's going to bed one night uh, on Christmas Eve, and he's worried about with sailors. He's afraid people are gonna try to get into his house, but everything seems calm, so he's falling asleep. And then all of a sudden, there's this giant noise outside. He's like, ah, crap, the with sailors are here. They're banging their stuff. They're gonna get, try to get into the house. This is not good. I hope we're all locked down, right? And so he goes to run outside to look outside, and he doesn't see with sailors. He sees a dirty peasant, a dirty old poor guy, but it's just one guy. Okay, maybe this isn't so bad. The guy forces entry into the house, but instead of taking things, he gives them. He puts gifts in the stockings and then leaves. And this, of course, is what was the night before Christmas, right? But this is how this poem, it's originally about this guy who's scared about with sailors. And Clement Clark Moore is trying to change the holiday, stop trying to get into my house, instead make it about giving gifts to kids. And basically, like Dickens, the poem becomes so popular that fooling your kids into thinking St. Nicholas comes down the chimney and puts presents in their stockings catches on like a fad. I mean, it basically almost becomes a religion. And the sailing stuff stops, and now everybody gives gifts to their kids on Christmas, right? But again, this is a tradition that's only about 200 years old. And giving gifts to kids at Christmas is only about 200 years old. Um, it depicts this holiday as a domestic child center affair, and so he's trying to domesticate Christmas. 
this is actually what St. Nicholas looked in the first illustrated version of the poem. He is a tiny little soot-covered elf with a stump of a pipe, but not a rotund giant person. Right? Uh, he's an elf because he has to be small to fit in the chimney, get into your house. Now, although the gifts were small, although small gifts had always been a part of December celebrations, uh, they had never been the focus. The focus was always the drinking and the sex and all that kind of stuff, right? The Santa tradition changed that. And now it starts to be about giving gifts to kids, right? But capitalists soon realize that there's this social obligation now about buying gifts. So they start ad campaigns to try to convince you, well, it's not only like, you don't only have to buy for your kids, right? Like husbands, should buy for their wives as well, right? And once that catches on, wives should also buy for, your hu for their husbands. And then once that catches on, well, why aren't you buying for your friends too, right? And so these social obligations to give gifts just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's all just marketing. There's no ancient tradition going back thousands of years that says we have to give gifts to everybody we know. Capitalists just told us we were obligated to do that and we bought it. There is no ancient tradition of doing this. This is an invented tradition. Again, about, in this case, a little less than 200 years old. Right? Um, people sort of get wise at some point. Like, the gift-giving obligation, uh, uh, Nissenbaum talks about a shop owner in the, in the late 1800s that tells a story about every woman who came into my shop to buy gifts had a list of people they had to buy for that was literally a yard long. Right? And industries start popping up. They, they produce these little things called gim, gim, gim cracks and doads. The doodads, they're these little useless baubles that you buy people to fulfill the social obligation. You know how to buy something for them at, at Christmas time, right? People will put them up on a mantle and display them for a couple of days and then they throw them away, right? Uh, we've wised up a little bit. This has changed into Christmas cards, right? Little kind of worthless things that we give out and you just play them for a couple of days and you throw them out, right? Uh, but it's a way to fulfill that obligation. But like there's entire industries that survive on this invented tradition, right? Um, tracking with me, are we making sense so far, All right? Um, there are worlds of money wasted at this time of year and getting things that nobody wants and nobody cares for once they are got. This seems like a very accurate right, uh, description of Christmas, a very, a very accurate complaint of Christmas, right? Especially our, our Christmas today, right? It's so commercial. It's so, yeah, that was Harriet Beecher Stowe in 1850. This, since, com since Christmas has been commercialized, this has been a problem. Um, I'm going to skip the Christmas tree. Um, it's in the book. Basically, it gets big over time because presents keep getting bigger, and the reason presents gets, get, keeps getting bigger is because capitalists keep convincing us that we need more to buy more and more and more and more stuff, and we have to be more and more expensive. Um, for that, there's the first Rockefeller Christmas tree in 1933. There's one in 2011. Uh, and this is very symbolic of what's happened to Christmas uh, over time. Right? It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, getting us back to kind of our thesis here, as holiday celebrations became popular again, right, Christians renewed their Constantinian effort to try to claim the holiday for themselves, right? And so since everyone's celebrating at Christmas, they want to claim it as Christian, and so they start inventing phrases like, they try to make it by proxy Christian. They try to make you by proxy Christian if you celebrate Christmas, right? Uh, and so they keep saying things like, keep Christ in, G uh, in Christmas, and Jesus is the reason for the season, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, as a way to try to create the false impression that, the Christi that, 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 that Christmas is Christ-centered, right? Um, in fact, they claim that, of course, it's about Christ because it's right there in the name, Christmas, right? But... This argument is really bad. Right? First of all, it wasn't called Christmas until 1100, right? And it's only called Christmas because you decided to call it that. This would be like me saying I own your dog because I went to your house and started calling it my dog, right? Like you can't just claim something because you've invented the name for it. Um, Christians, are, Christians are the one that started calling December celebrations that name over 5,000 years after December celebrations were around, right? Um, in addition, the name of something is completely irrelevant to its origin or its meaning, right? We, and nobody would rightly argue that when Christians go to church on Sunday, that they're celebrating the sun, right? And you might, well, but it's right there in the name, Sunday worship, right? Well, no, but that's, uh, yeah, that's the name, but that's not what, what defines it is the way, what we do. And we're not, what, if you look at what we do, we're not celebrating the sun, we're celebrating Christ, right? Exactly. 
if you look at Christmas, we're not celebrating Christ. The majority of the way the, ho the holiday is celebrated has nothing to do with Christ. Now, Christians may celebrate it that way, but the majority of society so celebrates it in a completely secular, non-Christian way, right? All the most famous Christmas songs, Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer, White Christmas, nothing to do with Jesus. All the most popular Christmas movies, nothing to do with Jesus. All the most popular Christmas stories, nothing to do with Jesus, right? We celebrate it in a completely secular way as a society. That's what Christmas is actually about, despite its name, right? So, does that make sense? Right, so they spread the falsehood that Jesus is the reason for a season as, as the way to try to claim the holiday for themselves, right? Uh, but as we've seen historically, this is clearly not the case. Uh, this creates the false impression that every element of the holiday is either derived from Christian tradition uh, or a perversion of it. Um, like, I mean, you, you saw this in the song, right? Like, if there were no, if there were no, if Jesus had not been born, then there'd be no Christmas tree, there'd be no Santa, there'd be no evergreens. Be, like, they're trying to get a Christian origin for all of this stuff. Did anyone see Kirk Cameron's movie a couple of years ago? Saving Christmas. Couldn't count yourself lucky. Um, <laughs> It's awful. I had to because before the book, and the book was coming out in the next year, I had to, I, he, he literally claims that every element of Christianity, every element of Christmas finds its origin in Christian lore. The feast in everything. And he just literally just makes up stories to try to appropriate this, right? Uh, and worse yet, Cameron actually argues that if you do not celebrate Christmas the way that his family specifically celebrates it, you're doing it wrong. Right? And actually, like, if you do not break out the richest butter at Christmas, and he actually uses the phrase, richest butter, which, I, I do, is there a section for that at the grocery store? I, so, like, then you're, you're, not, you're not celebrating Christmas correctly, right? Uh, and in fact, I kid you not, this is an argument he gave, like, one of the obvious criticisms of Christmas as a Christian holiday is it's extremely materialistic. Right? And like tradition, I mean, Christ was very centered on the poor, said the rich couldn't get into heaven, right? Like Christianity really should not be materialistic, right? And Cameron actually says it's perfectly fine for a Christian to be materialistic at Christmas because that's when Jesus became a material being. The fallacy is called equivocation, in case you're wondering, right? Clearly, material being is not materialism. Anyway, all right, so, um, but they have so convinced themselves that this is true that they, that, I mean, even like, I think priests from the pulpit are preaching this and not knowing that this is not the actual historical fact about where Christmas traditions actually come from, right? Um, there are still some who know it, like Jehovah's Witnesses. No, they don't celebrate Christmas, mainly for this reason, because they know it's not a Christian celebration, right? Uh, in fact, I occasionally get emails from Jehovah's Witnesses so, like, who see my work and say, yeah, good stuff, good job, right? So, um, so, okay, so now that we understand the history of it, this re reveals a few things, all right? How am I doing on time here? Am I running on time? Oh, we're okay. I want to get to the questions, though. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so, first of all, there is no war on Christmas. That makes no sense. If, it is, if there is a war on Christmas, it's the most unsuccessful war in history uh, because it literally just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger every year, right? Um, <laughs> For one thing, the, um, a lot of the claims about the war on Christmas are just outright false. Like people claim that um, you know, some school in Plano, Texas banned the colors red and green uh, in their, that never happened. It, they literally just make up stories of stuff that never happened. Um, one thing that is true is that there are efforts uh, to try to keep courthouses from putting up lone nativity scenes during Christmas time, right? That is true, like people have done that. Uh, and in fact, there's a series of court cases and there's been litigation on this. There's something called the reindeer rule uh, that basically says that a courthouse cannot put up a nativity scene and nothing else. They have to include secular elements around it uh, or just open up the space for anyone to put up anything like a festivus, coal made of beer, a festivus pole made of beer cans, which somebody did in Florida one year. Um, and, but the idea that like, Christians will claim that people trying to get courthouse nativities taken down, in fact, this happened in Wilkes-Barre, uh, uh, in 2009, where basically this is what they had. They just had a lone nativity scene, and uh, a King student, uh, Justin Bakula, actually pointed out, uh, yeah, that's unconstitutional. I'm calling the ACLU, the, the good one. Uh, and they had to take it down, right? And eventually they put one back up, but now they put reindeer and Santa next to it, and there's some other stuff there. Um, 
but I mean, this created quite a controversy, and people would claim that it's a war on Christmas. But notice that, like, like the claim that that's a war on Christmas seems to equate the nativity scene with Christmas. That Christmas is the nativity scene, so taking down the nativity scene is, un, is, is, is a war on Christmas, right? No, the nativity scene is one particular way that Christians invented to celebrate Christmas. Uh, basically, the idea comes from St. Francis of Assisi in the 1100s. One particular way the Christians do celebrate Christmas, but it's not equivalent to Christmas itself, right? It, 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 that, that, that idea feeds the notion that, well, the reason we celebrate is because Jesus was born on that day. That's not the reason we celebrate. We were celebrating at this time of year long before Jesus would have even been born, right? And so what it is a worry about is separation of church and state, and that's a legitimate worry, but that has nothing to do specifically with Christmas, right? And so the idea that there's a war on Christmas is just, it literally is something that, well, I shouldn't say that quite right. The liberal war on Christmas is something that Bill O'Reilly uh, made up and, and John Gibson uh, uh, made up, right? Um, interestingly, however, uh, the idea that there's a war on Christmas is nothing new. During the Cold War, people claimed that the communists were waging a war on Christmas. Uh, before that, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, I guess, Henry Ford said it was the Jews, right? Like, it's just this convenient way to demonize people that you don't agree with. Just say they're waging a war on Christmas. Right? Making sense? And that's really like how old the war on, the war on Christmas actually is. Um, I would argue, though, like, and so like part of this war on Christmas, like this is, uh, the song was, was saying this, right? Like if, if they don't say Merry Christmas, then walk on by and go in their store, right? Um, so I personally think that saying Merry Christmas, even if you're not a Christian, uh, even to a non and to a non-Christian, is not a big deal. It's about the equivalent saying, "How's your Sunday going?" Because the definition of the term is defined by how we celebrate the holiday, and we do not celebrate it primarily in Christian ways, right? Uh, the word, the meaning of the word, is defined by its use, and the way we use it is secular. Usually, even the word Christmas does not. Like, when you hear Christmas, you think Christmas tree and Santa Claus, right? It usually does not conjure up issue, uh, images of Christmas. And so I really think it's a non-Christian word, and it's perfectly fine for non-Christians to use it and to say Merry Christmas to other people. I think it's perfectly fine. Even if you wanted to, like, you guys are having your solstice party, right? Which is perfectly fine. If you wanted to call it a Christmas party, I don't think there's an issue there. I really don't. Because Christmas is not a Christian holiday. And this actually gets to me, like, to my fundamental disagreement with, with, with Flynn, Flynn thinks that you're adding legitimacy and, and giving, uh, giving uh, something to the Christians uh, by celebrating Christmas. You say, well, really, you're a by-proxy Christmas, Christian because you celebrate Christmas, right? Um, this is handing them a, a, a win in the war for Christmas that they never have won. Like, that you're basically, by not celebrating Christmas because you're not a Christian, is granting them their argument that Christmas is a Christian holiday, right? Don't grant them that argument say, no, Christmas is not a Christian holiday. I can celebrate it if I want to, and I can celebrate it however I damn well please, right? Mm -hmm. If someone told me that you can't celebrate on July 4th because America was founded as a Christian nation, so if you're not a Christian, you can't celebrate on July 4th, I'm not going to say, okay, I guess I'll get rid of my fireworks if that's a Christian holiday. I'm going to correct them and say, uh, no, America was not founded as a Christian nation. You need to learn your facts, right? I think we should do the same with Christmas, right? That's the argument. Um, So, if it's not about Jesus, then what is Christmas about? Well, if we define a Christmas, by our, a Christmas by our practices, then it's certainly no more religious than Independence Day or Thanksgiving or anything like that. Um, again, all the most popular Christmas songs, movies, etc., are secular. Our entire economy is defined by fourth quarter profits of Christmas sales. Uh, in 2005, 20% of all purchases were Christmas purchases. Um, we spend most of our Christmas opening presents and eating with family. Uh, we spend most of the season uh, feasting and drinking, right? It's, it's not a Christian holiday. That's not how it's celebrated. That's not even how, I mean, I, I really delighted in that song. I'm really glad you found that song uh, because notice that, right? Like when, when, how did that song completely define the activities of Christians at Christmas? If they don't see, if you don't see Merry Christmas, where? In a storefront. Then what are you supposed to do? Spend your money someplace else. Because that is what Christmas is actually about. It's about spending money. 
That's how capitalists have defined it for about the last 200 years. That's what it's really about. And even the Christians know it. Because when they protest somebody not saying Merry Christmas, what do they do? They don't spend their money. Because that's the real Christmas activity, right? So in a certain kind of way, like, it's completely secular. It's about spending money. It's not about religion. Unless, of course, like, aliens looking down at our activity on Christmas, kind of out of context, looking like, what are they doing on this day? What are they celebrating? They might actually think that consumerism was our religion, and it was our most holiest day of all. Right? That, if it's a religious holiday, that's, that's, what it, that's the religion it is for, is for capitalism. It's a consumerism holiday. Right? Um, as if consumerism was our, was our religion, and it kind of might be. Um, so who should celebrate the holiday? Whoever damn well pleases. Because it doesn't belong to Christians, it doesn't belong to anyone in particular. Um, I've kind of already gone over this. Uh, Flynn argues that you should not celebrate it because, you know, it gives Christians whatever they... No, it goes the other way. You're giving in to Christi Christianity's argument that they own the holiday if you don't celebrate it because you're not Christian. Right? Um, Christmas belongs to no one, and we'd still do it even if no one ever believed in Jesus, because December is just the appropriate time to celebrate um, in the ancient world, and so those traditions which just, which just, would just have carried over. Um, good. So who, wants to, who, who should celebrate? Whoever wants to. If you don't want to, you should feel no pressure to do so. You don't want to celebrate Christmas. There should be no, you shouldn't feel bad. There should be no social obligation to do so. It's perfectly fine not to celebrate. But if you do, regardless of your religious background, whatever, you should feel free to. Now, what ways should you celebrate? Well, really, you should kind of celebrate however you damn well please, right? Um, but there are a couple of things that we might keep in mind when we're deciding how we should celebrate. Um, I mean, the original motivations are gone, but you can celebrate just because it's fun if you so choose to, as long as it's harmless, right? Harmless celebrations are perfectly fine. Um, but not every way that we celebrate is actually harmless. Um, I talk in the book about how, like, we used to, when we did Christmas trees, put lit candles in the tree. That's a really dumb idea, right? Take a tree, kill it, put it, you know, take, take a dead tree, put it in your living room, and then put fire in it, right? Now, in Germany, where this tradition originated, it wasn't that harmful because most of their houses were made of stone, so if, the, if it burned down, then the tree burned down, your, your house smells like smoke, you cooked in your house anyway, not a big deal right? Uh, but in America, where the houses were made of wood, this is a really dumb idea, and people were dying. People were, were lighting their houses on fire at Christmas because they were putting candles in the damn tree, right? But did that stop us? No. We had to pass laws to say it's illegal to put candles in your Christmas tree and light them because that will burn down your house. We had to pass laws because people like, oh yeah, well they died last year, but it's tradition, so we got to keep, right? Like, we're so dumb that we will continue doing something simply because it's tradition, even though it's literally killing us, right? And I think that some of our traditions today are kind of like that. Um, for example, a lot of people hate Christmas because of the hustle and bustle and all the obligations that go along with it, right? Um, I don't know if it's literally killing us in that way, but it's a giant pain in the butt, right? Why not just do the things that you want to do and leave the rest out? Are you morally obligated to do these things because they've been going for, you know, they, 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 they trace back thousands of years a, no, that's an appeal to, an, an, a fallacious appeal to tradition. And B, they don't trace back hundreds of years. Most of these traditions that we've invented have been invented recently, right? So there's no reason that you have to keep doing that. You decide what you want to celebrate and don't let others push their expectations on you about how to celebrate. Um, it can even change year to year. Um, I like Christmas, so I research it. I usually put up a whole bunch of lights and create and all that kind of stuff uh, at my house. Uh, but this year we're going back to Oklahoma for like a week and a half during Christmas time, kind of press for time. I just didn't put up anything this year. Oh, well, I'll do it next year. It's not a big deal, right? The fact that I've done it every other year, right? Uh, we did still go see Bell's Nickel, though. That is one of our traditions. Uh, to always go see Bell's Nickel and Kutztown. down. That's a whole other thing. Um, but again, if it became a pain in the butt, we wouldn't go, right? You don't have to keep doing things just because. Uh, the Christmas feast. Christmas feasting made perfect sense in an ancient world because they did not have ready access to food all the time. It was a time to fatten up for the winter. It was the only time they had available food and drink, you know, like plentiful food and drink and that kind of stuff. Christmas feasting makes no sense in 21st century America. Absolutely no sense. What makes even less sense is two Christmas feasts, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Which, by the way, Thanksgiving is just Puritan Christmas. Puritans didn't like Christmas, remember? But they, did, they, they, they still thought, they still, they thought they needed to celebrate the harvest. 
And so they just invented their own version of a harvest celebration and called it Thanksgiving. So literally, like, in, the food, in the food department, we celebrate Christmas twice every year. Puritan Christmas and regular Christmas, right? We don't need that, right? We, we really have what's equivalent to a Christmas feast almost at every meal, right? Like, it, it, it's, it's just not needed. It's, it's not needed, right? And, and actually, um, studies have shown that the average American puts on a pound every year at Christmas that they never take off, right? So, right, like, so if you... If you kill an old American and like slice him in half, you can count his Christmas rings, right? You can see how many Christmases he has uh, on him, right? Um, presents. I mean, do our kids really need that many more toys? Do you and your spouse need more stuff that you don't already have? How much, like, how much do we really need, right? Um, and not, not only that, like, I mean, so we could be spoiling our kids here. Uh, I actually think that, in the, and again, I'll, I'll just go past this quickly. In the book, I have a whole chapter on this. I argue that Christmas spending is actually bad for the economy. It hurts that people think that the whole economy survives on it. I argue to the contrary and actually argue we'd be much better off without the obligation to spend as we do at Christmas. We could spend our money more wisely. We could spend it at a different time. Uh, we could even save it, pay off mortgages and student loans and that kind of stuff. And I actually think that that would be better off with us. I don't think the paradox of thrift is actually a paradox. Um, but I'll save that for the book. Um, we shouldn't give on credit, I think. That inflates the credit bubble and makes the economy weaker the more we spend on credit. And a lot of Christmas spending is done on credit. One good tradition, however, is the social inversion. And this is actually the most ancient of Christmas traditions is that social inversion, giving to the poor, right? Because in, in actuality, when you give at Christmas, you should be giving down the social ladder. If you give up, you're actually destroying value. If you spend $100 on a gift to someone who's richer than you, that $100 is worth less to them because they have more money. But if you spend $100 down, that $100 is a lot more valuable to someone who's a lot less well off, right? And so gift giving should go down and charity uh, giving to the poor is the most efficient way uh, to actually create value uh, in the economy. And so we should be doing more of that uh, and less of giving gifts to kids uh, and giving gifts to our boss uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, we should spend time, like, we should do what Scrooge does. A lot of people call me a Scrooge because of my attitude about this. And I basically say, yeah, I am Scrooge, the reformed version of Scrooge at the end of the book, who says, what Christmas should be about is giving to the poor and spending time with family. That's what it really should be about. Right? Not giving gifts to kids and all that kind of stuff. Right? Um, so, and then, this is my other talk. I don't think you should be lying to your kids about Santa. You shouldn't be tricking them into believing that he's literally real, especially if you're into skepticism and critical thinking. Uh, but again, that's a whole other argument. Chapter six in the book. Um, already kind of talked about holiday symbols, I, like a Christmas tree. I don't think a Christmas tree is anything particularly Christian. Um, Santa certainly is not something that's particularly Christian. I saw a news story recently uh, about a school that encouraged their um, teachers to avoid religious symbols in their classroom at this time of year, like Santa Claus. Santa Claus is not a religious symbol, neither is a Christmas tree. Nativity, yes. If you work for a public school system, you shouldn't be putting up a nativity because that's an explicitly Christian way to celebrate the holiday. You shouldn't be doing Christmas tree and Santa are not. Uh, by the way, because Santa is not actually St. Nicholas, whole other story in the book. Um, so we'll finish on this. Uh, isn't there anyone who understands what Christmas is all about? Sure, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. December 25th, is associated with the birth of many pa pagan gods, including Mithra uh, and others. Oh, I'm having trouble reading that. Um, step back here. Uh, Mithra and, uh, and Hercules and Zeus and Sol Invictus, the Roman fest for Saturnalia, uh, would also end around this, uh, this, this time. Uh, Christianity imported many of the pagan myths and traditions into its old customs around 400 AD. Today, Christmas expresses outrage that Christmas, Christians express outrage that Christmas is losing its Christian roots, but it's ironic since it was Christianity that hijacked the holiday in the first place to make it easier to convert new followers. Nevertheless, it is a wonderful opportunity to share our love with friends and family and comfort, comforting acts of goodwill for those that are less fortunate. It is the time for children to revel in their innocence and wonder about the world and adults to find their inner child. That is what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. I think that's a much better version of that little speech uh, that he gives. Uh, and so I'm open for questions. <laughs> Thank you.
Th thank you so much. Uh, since we have an abbreviated time today for a Q&A, I'm going to ask, you are going to lunch, right? Yes. So I'm going to prioritize, if anyone who's not going to lunch has, Chris, has questions for Kyle, I'm going to prioritize those first because we only have about five minutes. I'm so sorry about that. So no, no worries at all. Anyone? One over here. Hang on till I get him the mic for the benefit of the video. Yeah, Kyle, I'm just wondering if there's any movements out there to bring back Christmas orgies and how we can help. <laughs> Uh, there, um, I mean, there are like Christmas office parties aren't too far off, right? Uh, and there are some movies. I mean, I mean, this tradition does still sort of stick around. Um, there's actually a movie about a Christmas office party that's pretty raucous uh, this year. I forget exactly what it's called. Um, so, but like, hey, man, if you want to bring that back, go for it. Celebrate however you want, right? Anybody else? Hey. This will, this will have to... Just, Lehigh, Lehigh Valley Humanist does not endorse Christmas orgies. There you go. All right. I had, a, I had more of a comment. Um, one of the reasons why I like Christmas is not only because of the secular Christmas movies like Elf. Elf is one of my favorite movies. Sure. Um, basically, on the same, along the same lines of what the Charlie Brown caption you said there, I think Christmas is it's a great time for reflection people that aren't totally talkable to you and your family maybe extended friends you get a chance to like reconvene reflect uh things change you know stuff like that in general like people can be terrible at christmas but people can also be really nice at christmas and that's what i look forward to the emotional part of it yeah that's good i think that's i mean i don't have an answer to that or anything like that that, that sounds great to me anybody else got a question for kyle uh -oh. oh good thanks Tom. So uh, as a giving to the poor at Christmas is a good and fine tradition, but what about places like the Salvation Army that sit in front of these stores? Mm -hmm. They're explicitly a Christian organization that give to the poor. I don't necessarily put money in their buckets because I'm not sure exactly where that money's going after I put it in the bucket. Yeah. So if I, I had done before, but I was wondering what you thought about that, those kind of organizations. Yeah, so you need, I mean, with any charitable giving, whether it be at Christmas or not, you need to be careful about who you're giving to because not everybody gives it in wise ways. Um, I will not say anything specifically about Salvation Army because I don't know that much about how they're doing things currently. I have heard some people express some reservations about it, and so I think it's something you should definitely investigate before you would give to Salvation Army. Um, so totally, right? Uh, when I do it, I don't go through Salvation Army. I usually, there's a, some online uh, ways that you can go through and check charities and see how reliable they are and how much of their money goes to what they're actually promoting and that kind of stuff. Um, I forget the name of the Kiva. I think is the one. That's either the checker or the, the, I think Kiva was the charity I chose one time. They give out loans for education. Charity Navigator. Charity, is, is, so Charity Navigator is the, how you check it. And I think I found Kiva as a charity on there that has a really good uh, ranking. He was very good, right? And basically, uh, you know, I will often give uh, money for education. Uh, usually I try to find a female overseas who is trying to pursue an education. And because I think that is very, very, like you kind of get your most bang for your buck. Because uh, the more, like, Studies kind of show that the more educated a female population is in an area, the better off that the area is, right? Uh, and so I think it's a really good way to do it, right? Um, but the second thing I'll say about this, and this is, this, this is, so here's a little pitch for the book. The book is chocked full of little fun nuggets like this that will kind of blow your mind. Um, where the bell ringing gets its origins in Salvation Army, and this is literally just like a paragraph in the book, but where the bell ringing gets its origins is that what the Salvation Army used to do as part of their charitable organization, uh, is and reaching out to the poor at Christmas time, is they would put on big, lavish dinners and invite the poor to come in and eat these big, lavish dinners, right? What they would do is they would rent out Madison Square Garden, for example, and they would put out tables and they would fix a big meal and then invite the poor to come in. But how they paid for it was they sold tickets to rich people to come and watch the poor people eat as a spectacle. And so they would get dressed up all in their bests, and they would go and sit in the, in the seating in Madison Square Garden and look and wonder at all these poor people and their ravish hunger and laugh as someone slipped some turkey into their pocket or something like that. And it was a, it was a spectacle. 
for them. That's how they paid for it. And what they couldn't pay for, what that didn't pay for, they got as people walked out. They had people dressed as Santa, ringing bells. They get people to give a little bit more money as they left. And that's actually where the bell ringing comes from. Cool, huh? I think we have the one more question here from Dave in the back, and then we'll wrap up. There is one more uh, tradition that Christmas has brought about, which is the Nutcracker. Mm. And the Nutcracker is this conception of civility and, and high art merged together that is really sort of the essence of what you're suggesting, too. Mm. It's, it's uh, not the only great art that's come out of Christmas, I mean, pop songs. And uh, actually, the Bach Choir is doing the, uh, I'll put a plug for the Bach Choir, doing the Christmas Oratorio this weekend. But there is great music and great art that has come out of whatever Christmas is. Yeah, ab absolutely, I agree, yeah. I mean, there's definitely benefits to it in that way. There's also really crappy stuff, too, that comes out, right? Um, but like, you know, I like Elf, too, right? It's pretty fun. Um, I'm not a big fan of Miracle on 34th Street, but that's another, that's another story. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, well taken, well taken. Any other questions? Don't be glad to hang out for a while, ask questions. I've got some books to sell uh, if you're interested, and then I'll be at, at dinner as well. Okay, we'll be in the back if you need us. Otherwise, we will see you next time. Great. Thanks for having me.